Okay, if there's nothing else, Jay, you want to introduce our speaker? <laughs> Well, you know, recently uh, we've had some cold weather, we've had some wet weather, uh, but when I was out in my garden recently, uh, I noticed the daffodils are coming up. And I'm starting to see little signs of spring, like tree buds and things. So spring is just around the corner, and uh, I know we're all anxious for that time to get here. And uh, I think it would be appropriate if we had somebody for our meeting this uh, month to kind of lead us into that. So I wanted to have somebody come talk to us about pollinators. And uh, I couldn't think of anybody better than Dr. Kristen Baum from OSU. Uh, she is a professor in the Department of Integrative Biology. She is also Associate Dean for Research for the College of Arts and Sciences at OSU, so she's a busy person. Uh, she earned her BS degree uh, in environmental science from the College of William and Mary. She got her master's degree in wildlife and fisheries from Texas A&M University, where she studied hummingbirds. And then she got her PhD in entomology from Texas A&M also. So she is well credentialed. Uh, she is a real expert in the field of pollinators and pollinator interactions with their habitats and the influence that the things that we do to habitats may have on pollinators. Um, she is, has been, and I'm sure still is, a member of numerous state, uh, regional, and national working groups on pollinators. So she's helping to actually formulate policy based on science, and uh, she's just a really good friend too. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kristen Baum to talk to us about conservation concerns and opportunities for monarchs and bumblebees. Um, 
kind of stemming from a lot of the questions we were getting because, you know, for us, um, it doesn't mean anything for the Endangered Species Act. You know, this is a separate, um, separate listing, so they're not actually endangered, you know, for us uh, currently in the U.S. But I guess what is worth mentioning uh, is that they revisit this uh, listing where they precluded them every year. So, so they'll continue to revisit that. So with the um, uh, adding them to the red list under the IUCN um, could potentially change you know, what they end up doing in the future. So it's um, interesting to think about what, the, what that could potentially mean for monarchs and, and um, how they contribute and provide um, more resources for them. Um, and so I put this in here. Um, so you know, if they revisit the listing decision, which they'll do every, every year, um, the original petition, which again was in 2014, um, had, I think this is actually the very last page of the, the <laughs> petition, so over here on the right-hand side where they had an appendix, because everybody wants to know what does that mean for, you know, programs like tagging or, uh, you know, schools rearing monarchs as part of classroom projects and research, you know, what does it mean for all of those things? So we don't know, um, but they did, did have some statements at the very end uh, where they make some suggestions about what that could mean, uh, which would mean that you know research that is looking to benefit the monarch related to conservation um, in their biology could continue. Um, that when there's you know a benefit to the public in terms of education and home rearing and things like that, that that could continue at some level. So uh, so it's kind of interesting to look back and see you know what was recommended uh, to think about what might happen um, when they revisit that decision. <coughs> coming up, um, I guess, towards the end of this year. Um, and so this is just kind of a, a blow up of, of that section, um, but the original suggestion was to, to allow a lot of those activities to continue to so the way that we engage with monarchs um, from the community and, and public perspective. Uh, so if we think about um, helping the monarch and how we can uh, conserve the monarch, provide resources, provide habitat, this map is of um, public lands in the, the U.S., so you can see um, very few and scattered and kind of concentrated uh, more in the West. So thinking about how do we get involvement, um, you know, it would clearly require a lot of public involvement and public or private involvement in private lands and, and uh, the contributions of uh, citizens uh, thinking about what they can do to contribute. So I actually kind of delved into to some of the literature thinking about uh, what, did, what does it actually mean and, and what could that look like. Um, and um, this is actually a study that uh, one of my students who just uh, finished her PhD uh, at, in December, uh, so a very recent graduate, she worked on um, native bees um, kind of in canola wheat landscapes in Oklahoma, but she also did a survey um, of people who attended different conferences related to agriculture and production and who might have an interest in pollinators. So it was kind of interesting and timely thinking about, about what this means. So she had the, the green bars are for producers that had pollinated dependent crops. And it was a little hard to categorize people because a lot of people um, have multiple um, you know, agricultural investments and not just one crop or, you know, or they do crops and livestock and other types of things. Uh, the PI was pollinator independent producers and then livestock ranchers um, are the orange bars. So it was interesting asking them about their concern for honeybees and that was in the context of concern about the decline for agriculture. Um, so, um, you know, I think it's, um, in, it was at one of those scales where it ranged from negative two if you strongly disagree to positive two if you strongly agree. Um, so you can see here everything is at least on the positive side. Uh, but the, that livestock ranchers were, were high up there compared to the other groups. Mm -hmm. You know, that's actually important if you think about the um, amount of, of land available and kind of complementary land use things where um, monarchs could benefit as well. So I think that's a, a real positive. Um, and then there was also a question about concern for wild bees, again, in the context of agriculture. And again, um, the livestock ranchers um, uh, had a high level of concern. So again, I think that's, that's promising. That um, and then um, we also asked about willingness to implement, um, you know, conservation practices that would benefit uh, pollinators. Um, and so, uh, so again, um, you know, everything's on the positive side. Uh, you know, all in the uh, one to two. So agree to strongly agree 
range. Um, and again, we kind of see the same thing, that there would be support for implementing conservation practices. And then the other one that's interesting about actively seeking out information um, uh, and thinking about where, where do people go for information about how they can, how they can support uh, pollinators. So that was interesting as well. Um, and that kind of got me interested in looking at some of the other resources available. So I pulled this from a paper, um, actually, was it this weekend, I think? Uh, anyway, super recently, uh, that I came across this one. And so uh, it's interesting thinking about where do people get their information. Um, and so um, the dark bars mean frequent use and the lighter bars and frequent use. So of course, at OSU, you know, I value our OSU extension, um, and, but I'm looking at the campus extension here. So it's in the infrequent uh, category with very little frequent use. So if you look at where would most people be getting their information, it's actually chemical dealers, seed dealers, and then other farmers. So I think it's thinking about making connections to uh, you know, neighbors and people, you know, so I think um, you know, there's opportunities, I think about the Audubon Society, you know, to, to reach out and potentially make more of a difference if you can reach people more where they are. Because I think a lot of the resources we think of for, you know, as scientists, we're thinking about all of these public resources down here that don't, don't uh, seem to be the most uh, frequent source of, of information. Um, and then I just threw this in, it's interesting, you know, thinking about there's research on, you know, what are barriers to participation, um, and it, it was interesting, they, they looked at private land uh, conservation studies and then endangered uh, species conservation studies, um, and so trying to look about, you know, what are the barriers, um, you know, what, where, uh, what are the motivations to participation, so, you know, as we think about, you know, how do we support the monarch at a really, really large scale, it's going to be knowing some of these answers, right? Like, what, what leads people to want to participate and how can we, we work with that. So, uh, so I kind of went off on a tangent because I got interested in this over the weekend. So, um, <laughs> and with Ashley finishing her presentation. Uh, so interesting thing. So now to some more uh, monarch stuff. So this is the uh, graph that shows uh, the size of the monarch colonies on the overwintering grounds every year. Um, and if you remember, uh, they were the petition to list them uh, came out in 2014, so that was actually the very lowest uh, time period for population size. So, and we don't have the size yet for this current overwintering population, but what they do is they'll fly over the overwintering grounds and make an estimate of how many hectares are covered by monarchs. So they'll look at the orange and the trees and, and make an estimate um, at, where, at where they're at. But you can see it's, it bounces around a lot. You know, if you think about insects, um, you know, they have really high uh, reproductive output and survival can be very variable. So there's so many factors that, that influence what that looks like every year. So it'll be interesting to see, see what the pattern is, um, is this year. Um, and they've also uh, kind of delved into, you know, how many monarchs are there per hectare, right? Because that makes a big difference. So what does this actually mean? So 2.84 hectares from, from last year, and how does that translate into number of monarchs? Um, and so there's been various studies, but the most recent one, you know, looked at a bunch of different ways of estimating um, the size of the population, and they came up with this 21.1 million monarchs per hectare as, you know, kind of the most reasonable a uh, reasonable um, estimate. Uh, so that's kind of the current science behind what seems like the best approach. But it's interesting because if you think about them on the overwintering grounds or how densely they're clustered, you know, there's so many factors that influence how many millions of monarchs you end up with per hectare. Um, so in Oklahoma, um, we tend to see monarchs um, in, in March, we'll be getting our first sightings. Um, and then we'll have some activity in Ed Lane um, on into June. Um, and then we'll see monarchs again. Um, I usually say mid-August, but again, this is kind of shifting and depending on the year, we might even see them kind of consistently throughout the, uh, throughout the summer as well. I think urban areas tend to be a little bit, a little bit different. Uh, but we'll typically see them about mid-August um, and then um, on through the migration uh, through, the, through October. And so a lot of my research has focused on um, either milking and forb availability early in the year, um, and we'll have lots, um, depending on where you're looking at, um, uh, quite abundant um, amounts of milkweed early in the year. 
Um, and then we'll also uh, look at that fall breeding population. Uh, so that's where we spend a lot of time. Um, so, the, so there's monarchs that move south early. Um, so kind of arriving in mid-August, they're laying eggs, they're producing another uh, generation of monarchs, and then they'll join that fall migration. So that's kind of where we focused a lot of our efforts in my lab. Um, so this is a picture actually from a roadside um, near my house, near the turnpike where I get on to, to come over to Tulsa. Um, and so Asclepias viridis is our most common uh, milkweed plant uh, throughout Oklahoma. Uh, so, uh, so in the background here, you know, all these light green flowers. Um, I almost put in the video, um, I did a slow motion one you know, kind of driving down the road where, like, you know, it's interesting, I tend to milkweed watch every time I go anywhere where I'm, like, looking and going, oh, milkweed, milkweed, milkweed. It can be kind of irritating, I admit. Um, you should ask my daughter. Uh, she's like, really? Do we have to keep, keep going on about this? Um, but here's a close-up view, and then here's kind of the distribution of where the light green is, is where uh, Asclepias viridis tends to be uh, distributed. But that's kind of our most common milkweed. When you start to get to the kind of upper edge of, of Oklahoma, um, uh, for example, at the Tallgrass Prairie Reserve, we'll start to get some of the milkweeds that are important in other regions of the country, like um, Asclepias thoriaca, which is common milkweed. Um, so we'll see them, but you know, for, and so, you know it's kind of interesting uh, thinking about doing research you know, with milkweed that could be taller than you versus you know, getting down on your hands and knees and flipping over leaves. So, so very different uh, uh, scenarios. But, here early May um, is when this picture was taken. Um, and then typically uh, the milkweed develops seed pods and then uh, I usually say around July 4th, uh, it will dihiss and release the seeds and then the plants tend to die back. So just as a natural part of the uh, plant process, the growth process for perennial plants. Uh, so this is kind of the same, same location in August and so uh, you go back out there you know, and the plants will have senesce, they'll come back the next year. But if you um, burn, so my example of the very first um, title slide, you know, if you burn or you mow uh, the milkweed, or uh, some percentage of the milkweed will regrow. Um, and uh, also, I think depending on precipitation patterns, sometimes you can have some milkweed emerging later. Uh, so it's, it's really um, interesting. And I think we usually say, um, you know, at sites that have milkweed, if you mow or you burn, we'll maybe have maybe a fifth of the milkweed that was there in the spring will be there. So what triggers certain plants to regrow? We don't really know. I had a cool study designed um, at one point at the OSU Cross Country course, and I, we had spray painted the base of the plants depending on if they were vegetative, if they had flower buds, if they were flowering, or if they had seeds. So the idea of thinking, okay, maybe it's the ones that are vegetative that haven't reproduced that regrow, but then they didn't mow. So anyway, uh, there went that nice cool project. <laughs> but wanting to see which ones actually actually regrew. Um, so, but uh, interesting uh, thinking about uh, milkweed availability in the spring uh, versus the fall. Um, and so these are some of our uh, roadside uh, mowing sites on the right. And this is actually, we went out, uh, we were, um, so we looked at different mowing regimes in these sites, but we were redoing um, our study um, because there's a lot of variability on the roadside. We have multiple sites along 51 and also north on, on 35 from Stillwater, but we wanted to redesign and have each treatment within each site to kind of reduce some of the chain site variability. So we went out and flagged all the milkweed. So you can you can see some of it, and this, some of this is off of our transect where you can see the light green flowers, but every, every flag, both the orange and the yellow, represent a milkweed plant. So, I mean, just, you know, there, there was more than you could kind of see just driving past um, at the site, so it's kind of interesting to look at it. Um, and then we've also done, um, I had a student um, a few years ago that did some roadside surveys. Uh, so he would drive, um, I think he stopped maybe every 10 kilometers and got out and uh, did a, we do um, a five meter by 50 meter transects and counted milkweed. And so this is a, a map of what he found. So there's dots that, that are kind of open circles. There wasn't milkweed at, at those sites that he stopped, but then depending on the size of the circle, it shows the amount of milkweed um, at that particular site. But about 40% of our transects had milkweed, and most of it was Asclepias viridis. We did pick up some other species, so it's kind of interesting um, looking at, at roadsides and uh, milkweed availability. 
And then I collaborated with Justin Dee, um, who was a um, PhD student under Mike Palmer um, and graduated um, a few years back. And so they did growth rings on milky plants to age them. And so, um, so you can take very slim, uh, uh, thin slices and kind of look at the, what the age of the milky plants are. And, and I just think this is, is fascinating. So here's the graph over here, but you can see kind of there's a bunch that are in this 10 to 15 year range, but some of them can be you know, up to 20, 25 years old, which I just find amazing. Um, you know, that, that milkweed can, uh, can live that long. Uh, and so, um, and this is an example, you know, when he was, uh, you know, digging up, so this is what it looks like underneath. So, and that's a big difference for us too, in this region of the country, you know, our milkweed, it has these big tubers that the plants are growing from, so they're not spreading via rhizomes underground, you know, they, they're kind of individual plants versus, you know, when you move farther north and the common milkweed's the one that spreads underground, it can be kind of more, more invasive. Um, and then it's really interesting thinking about, you know, you look at this, um, this graph here, and there's like none not really represented on the lower end, right? So it's interesting um, thinking about, you know, all those little seedlings that come up and then just seem to disappear. So, you know, what are years that are good for recruitment of new individuals? Um, you know, when, when are we actually getting new um, uh, Asclepias viridis plants added to the population? So, so kind of another interesting uh, potential direction. Um, so thinking about uh, what we uh, did with the, those late generation monarchs that arrived in uh, mid-August. Uh, so we would go out in the field um, and collect uh, late instars, so fourth or fifth instars. Um, I always like to point out, you know, you look for the frass, because if you don't see the piece of frass, then you're you know, frantically looking because there's got to be a caterpillar there. Um, uh, but, but yeah, this is one of my, my, one of my favorite pictures. But we'll bring them back to the lab um, and rear them to adulthood, um, which also got us interested in looking at some of the parasites they can have, um, and then also uh, comparing kind of the uh, that late generation of monarchs to, to migrants as well uh, that are moving through. So this is, um, I used to always feel like I needed to make the case that those monarchs that we get starting in mid-August, you know, that they actually have the potential to contribute to the overwintering population. Because a lot of people would say, you know, oh, um, you know, they're not going to make it. They're just, you know, it's a, it's a waste of, um, of, of activity. Um, so this was a plot um, where I plotted. It had to be years where I had both the late generation activity and the migrants. Uh, so I didn't have a lot of years, but you can see. So this is when they emerged. So when they emerged as adults and when they could potentially migrate. Um, so I've got, I ended up plotting by week, um, but essentially kind of green is maybe good timing, and then once you start getting to the blue, it's maybe getting later and later in the migratory season. Um, but you can see, you know, compared to the migrants, you know, the, that late generation seems to, to do quite well timing-wise, right? Um, so I always felt like I needed to try to justify, at least early on, um, in the conversation about monarchs, but then the study came out uh, where they looked at stable isotopes from monarchs on the overwintering grounds over, um, I guess, close to a 38-year period. Luckily, it's on the graph, I didn't have to uh, try to figure it out. But over a 38-year period, so they could tell you know, what region of the country those monarchs came from. Uh, so on average, you know, we, they call it Southwest. I do not know why. It's obviously South Central. Uh, for those of us that live here, uh, but uh, but you know you can see we're you know 11 percent. Uh, that's a lot of monarchs, you know, big contribution to the overwintering population. And then if you look at kind of the range across years, sometimes it's really low and about five percent, but then other years it's 30 percent. So a lot of it's just you know what does the year look at like? You know what were conditions farther north? You know where were the monarchs able to uh, to do best? So I don't necessarily feel like I have to justify that much as much anymore but uh, since the study came out um, but uh, but definitely interesting thinking about uh, that late generation and its contribution to the overwintering population um, so we also uh, were studying Ophrobia cystis electrospira um, which is often called just called OE uh, for short so that is a spore forming protist uh, that when monarchs are infected um, their body will be covered with these spores. So this is a tape count sample. You can actually just take a piece of tape. Uh, we've actually started using mailing seals because they're a little easier to get off. 
you can gently press it against the abdomen, so just the you know outside of the abdomen, uh, so about where where the mark is, um, and then it will pull off some scales, which they use, use naturally, so it doesn't harm them. And then if they've got spores, um, the spores will will show up as well. So it's really easy to non-destructively sample. So you can really you can sample for this. Uh, so it's really easy to do the tagging. So in the background, these big things are the uh, scales from the abdomen. And as you can see, these little dots in here, I've got to blow up later on. They're kind of actually like lemon or lime shaped, uh, but those are the spores. So you can look under the microscope. So this one was very heavily um, infected. And there's been some uh, studies that have looked at infection rates kind of across um, years. And so they um, uh, say about you know 5% of the monarch population is infected on average. Uh, and then we, we really had just wanted to study um, OE. Um, oh, and I should actually provide a little bit more context. And so then, um, so, so, so the monarchs don't fly as well, they don't live as long when they're infected. And then when they lay eggs, some of the, the spores of the parasite will come up on the eggs. So then when they, you know, the uh, first in start caterpillars, when they first emerge, they'll eat their eggshell, or when they're eating uh, milky leaf tissue, they might consume these spores and become infected. Um, so, uh, so we originally had planned to study OE, uh, but then we had a lot of mortality from tachinic fly, so um, from our, our late in stars, um, and so, um, uh, so these are just some examples. So we would bring them back in the lab, and, and a lot of them, we, either it's very late in stars, um, they would have um, fly maggots emerge, or you know once they start to go into their J, or even from the chrysalis, they can also emerge from the chrysalis. Uh, and then occasionally you'll find dead ones in the field that you can then collect, and which you, you know sometimes the, the uh, flies haven't emerged yet. Um, but you know, these have you know, these um, you know, there is no survival with the tachinic flies. You know they're not not going to make it, so so it's an important uh, parasite um, that infects the monarchs as well. And there's some some studies not as recent, but that suggest about 16% um, of fourth and fifth in stars. Uh, may be infected and have tachinid flies, and then it would be a, um, just under 10% kind of across all life stages. Um, so, and I, I don't think I said it to automatically, but is there a way I can click on the video thing? Uh, uh, let's see. Um, I want it to play the video. Um, Well, it might not go, but um, is there a video on that? Movie? So it was, uh, yeah, the little um, button down there should work. But um, I was just excited because this fall was the. Oh, is it was the YouTube? Um, it it links to YouTube. I tried. Yeah, I don't have it. I don't have it. Wi-Fi oh, okay. turned okay. on. Okay, but um, and you can see the monarch flying there. But it was the most I've ever seen. So those are the Amelia bushes. I would have mentioned to a few people. So this is actually by the Colvin Center, the OSU Recreation Center, but they also have them all over campus. Um, and so, but this was the most monarchs I've ever seen. They kind of blend in because the billion bushes are kind of modeled, but um, uh, but uh, like, so I would stop by every evening on my way home. I started setting a timer because I was just getting like too many monarchs to process once I got, you know, in the evening once I got home. But uh, I think I was getting you know, two or even three per minute. So I, you know, I could end up with like 80 or just hanging out for a brief amount of time. Um, so um, but it's just the most I've ever seen uh, this year on campus, so I was very excited. And there's no need to go anywhere else because the Azalea bushes are, are such a good good resource, although I still have not gotten around to sampling nectar from them to see see why. They're very fragrant. You can uh, kind of smell them from the distance. But And then, so we've been measuring wing size. Uh, so we'll measure the, the length of the uh, right forewing and then also the width. Um, and then we've been weighing them to get an idea of, um, you know, like where are they fueling up for the migration. And so this would be an example um, of, uh, you know, stopped by the Colvin, got a bunch, now I'm staying up till midnight so I can get these all processed. Um, so. Uh, let me, let me uh, I can get the video for you here. If you just, let me just turn on the Wi-Fi here. Yeah. 
<clears throat> and then we'll also tag them at the end. So we kind of have this process. I have a very um, specific routine that I have decided works the most effectively for processing as many as quickly as possible. But um, but we'll, we'll get all those measurements to try to give us a bit better picture of what the migration um, looks like, and then we'll tag them. Um, and then my goal is always to, to get them out, you know, kind of same day or as I collect them that evening, eat the next morning, uh, so that they can continue on their migration. And it's not, it may not be as exciting to everyone. I was just super excited with the number. And the, the video doesn't even do it justice. So, you know, I've kind of walked along and you can see them kind of disturbed and fly up a little bit. Um, and I will say this was the first year too, um, you know, there would be students stopping and taking pictures because it was that noticeable that there were that many monarchs around. So it was kind of fascinating. Um, it's playing on the computer, but not playing on. Okay. Hmm. Well, we will keep going. What, what, when? Oh. Um, uh, so looking at some migration patterns, uh, so here I kind of plotted by week again, so thinking, you know, if they're, and here's my little key at the top, so if they make it through our area, you know, by the, through the first week of October, I just made them green, some shade of green, so thinking about that's good timing to get to the overwintering grounds, and then the blue is it's getting kind of later and later. So it's really interesting uh, that you kind of see the patterns for the Stillwater area every year. But what's even more fascinating, um, I'm working on a, a study uh, with some scientists um, from Canada all the way through to the overwintering grounds in Mexico, uh, where we're looking at uh, lipid accumulation, so where are they fueling up and what does that look like? We had these really interesting conversations. Um, and Chip Taylor, who's the director of Monarch Watch, he was, he's, uh, was the one that kind of started this study. But I think we're talking about 2019. He was talking about how that was a really late year. Well, I'm like, well, it's a pretty good on time year in Stillwater. Uh, you know, so it's really fascinating. And then uh, 2020, um, I, we had very, very few monarchs. I don't have how many, um, I might have to show on the next slide. Let's see, yes, I did. Well, then it's proportional females. But, um, you know, but then 2020, we had almost no monarchs, but then, you know, there were lots of reports from the Oklahoma City Zoo and other areas. So it's interesting thinking about um, you know, how even just, uh, you know, short distances east to west or north to south, you know, the migration could look very, very different. So how do you get a real handle on, you know, what is it looking like each year? Because, you know, we were having very different conversations about what we thought the migration looked like every year based on what we saw in our area. Uh, so it, it varied varied a lot. And the other interesting thing, which I learned that I did not know, um, is I have the proportion of females um, up there. So you can see each year. So this year we had, we, we um, tagged over a thousand monarchs, um, but you can see we only had 30% females. So general, generally you would expect um, them to have like a 50-50 sex ratio. Um, uh, but um, apparently the migration uh, is more male biased. So there'll be more males, but then on the overwintering grounds, the males die more. So by the time that they are starting the migration in the spring, it'll be you know much more heavily females. So it's kind of interesting thinking about that. But I learned that from uh, Chip just last week, which was something completely new to me. I had been interested uh, in the sex ratio aspect because um, here's some of my late generation versus migrant monarchs. Um, you know, because I, I thought it was. Um, Interesting that, you know, it's not like we lost them along the way before they get to Oklahoma where we're having more males and females. They're actually emerging, you know, because these are our ones we reared in the lab, right? They're actually more emerging with um, fewer females and males. So that's, um, and it could, could be that it varies very, very differently depending on which generation you're looking at. So maybe if you're looking at one of those during the breeding season where they live a few weeks, maybe you'd see a very, very different pattern. Um, okay, so here's some of my pretend fly and OE data. Um, so the percent flies is are the gray bars. You can see, um, you know, 40 percent. Our lowest year was just under 20 percent. Um, but you know, we can see one year, 2017, we lost a, um, 
two thirds of our the ones we collected did, depended live mm -hmm. in a pre maybe. And I will admit these were different studies that I compiled, so I think rangeland, urban, and so they're not necessarily comparable per se. Um, mm -hmm. But I put them all um, on the same graph. And I guess these are my sample sizes. So you know, so we had 299 um, that we reared um, that year. Um, and so also um, then OE. Uh, so what I did for that one is I took out all the ones that died from dakinic flies. So not to count them in that sample since we took them and sampled them for OE. Uh, but you can see we had a high year. Um, and this was a drought year in 2012. But then our rates have been you know, relatively um, uh, below 10% for that fifth generation. Um, and then, no, it was just rainfall. Uh, but then I wanted to compare um, OE levels for that late generation versus the migrants, right? So we've got lots of, of data for the migrants. So it's kind of interesting. And I would expect you know, that last generation because there's a lot less milkweed out. Uh, so you know, if you just, you're more likely to encounter spores you know, if the monarchs are moving among the milkweed. Uh, so we had you know, higher levels of OE infection in that late generation where we reared those um, fourth and fifth instars to adults than we did uh, for the, the um, migrants that we collected. So you can see 2021 was a, uh, uh, had a high percentage of OE infection, uh, but it dropped down here in uh, 2022. And this was the year we had very few monarchs. So I was out looking um, you know, twice a day, if not more, um, and we caught a lot of people. They just weren't, weren't around. Um, and I had Chip you know, kept telling me, go look, they're out there. And I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> so, so we tried, but we failed. But this year was a good year. Um, and so there, I pulled that paper uh, where they're looking across the eastern US at OE infection levels um, to compare to ours. And it was really interesting if you look at just the migrant data you know, that we tend to have um, you know, a lot, we're the gray bars, but we have a lot lower infection levels than if you're looking across the eastern US. So I don't know exactly uh, what to make of that. You know, certainly we're getting closer to you know, the overwintering ground, so it may be that some individuals were lost along the way, or it could have something to do with the kind of the sampling and we're having a, we're sampling a very large number of individuals. Because I will say, you know, the interesting thing about OE, if you, if you expect if you collect 100 individuals and only five are going to be infected, it's a really good, a good idea for the infection rate is you've got to collect a bunch and bunch, right? Because if you just get 100, then it's not going to really tell you for sure. You're not going to know. So I think sample size um, could come into play as well. Um, but, um, but definitely interesting. And then I have a colleague, um, Matt Bullock, he's a parasitologist um, in my a department at OSU, and he's uh, really gotten interested in OE. He's also a great source because he'll go out and collect monarchs during migration and bring them to me to process. Um, so, uh, so he has brought me many monarchs, and so they always talk about you know when monarchs are heavily infected that they're going to be deformed. Um, but I will say, of all the ones we reared uh, from late in stars, fourth and fifth in stars in the field, I mean, we've had some that have been deformed, but they haven't been infected with OE. So we haven't seen, so it could be also a artifact of infection levels that you get in the lab when you're artificially infecting them, because uh, we typically haven't seen um, any deformity. But he's been looking at how they deposit, um, deposit their eggs. And so it's interesting, you know, he collected a bunch of eggs in the field, and they would have very few spores. But then when he had them lay, had infected individuals lay eggs in the lab, you can see these are um, scales from the body of the insect. So maybe they're getting a much heavier dose you know, in the lab than what they are in the field. So he's, he's been doing some interesting work. And then these are um, SEM photos. So this is the top of an egg, but you can see the spores. And here's another blow up. So, uh, so it's really cool. He does some really, really fascinating work. And then he's also been looking to see if the, the uh, spores are infective. So the infective stage would be the sporozoites. Uh, so kind of looking to see if they, they are actually infective or not. And this is also cool. This is a milkweed leaf. So they, these are the stomata of the, the leaf. And then you can see the spores in there too. And they kind of, um, his description is that they kind of seem to get embedded in the waxy cuticle of the milkweed plants. Uh, so it's kind of interesting thinking about, you know, what that means for, uh, for uh, transmission of the parasites. 
So I'm going to shift gears and talk about um, bumblebees now. Um, so we have three bumblebee species in Oklahoma that are currently being considered for listing under the Endangered um, Species Act. Um, this is the American bumblebee bombus of Pennsylvanicus in my yard on uh, blue sage. Um, you can see what's a little, little beat up here. Uh, but I was going to run through our three that are being considered for listing. So Bombus pensylvanicus, American bumblebee is one. Um, and these are all recently submitted for, for listing. Uh, and so I pulled some information from a few various locations. But you can um, identify bumblebees based on the color patterns on their thorax and their abdomen. So their thorax being uh, the middle part of their body and then the abdomen. And I guess sometimes you might look at the, the head as well. Um, so, um, so it's one that they can be um, relatively easily identified uh, from photographs, although getting good photographs can be a challenge. But this shows iNaturalist and all the sightings for the um, American bumblebee in Oklahoma. So it's actually probably our most common um, bumblebee in Oklahoma, but in other parts of its range, it's drastically declined. Um, so they, they may be doing okay here, but not, not in other areas. <laughs> Um, so, uh, and I could um, send this out or post this somewhere, but I was just going to mention, so the bumblebee, so the kind of keys to what the color patterns look like, um, two of my graduate students, um, uh, Terry and Emily, um, worked with um, Andrina in entomology to develop an extension fact sheet on how to identify the female. So I've got a picture of that in a minute. And then you can pull uh, phrenology data, so when you would expect them to be active, uh, from some of the Xerxes Society um, information. So they've got these phenology charts on like when are the queens active, workers, males, um, and then iNaturalist was where I pulled the, the bumble, uh, bumblebee maps. Um, so going back to the um, American bumblebee, and I went ahead and this one, uh, the males uh, look uh, very different. Uh, so these are males, and I took this when I was looking for monarchs at the Botanic Garden this fall. Um, so you can see males are going to be late in the year. So again, males um, um, on uh, uh, Nala there. And then here's one from my yard. So you can see how fuzzy they are um, and how their, their abdomen is, is um, they can have a very different uh, color pattern. It's one that frequently throws people and says, what is this? Uh, but it's just a, a male um, American bumblebee. Uh, so the next one is uh, the variable cuckoo bumblebee, uh, Bombus variabilis, um, and so this would be the color pattern. Um, it, it's thought to be, um, it's a cuckoo bee, so it's a, it parasitizes the nest of other bumblebees, and it's thought that um, the previous one I talked about, Bombus pensylvanicus, is, is its host, right? Um, but you can see we've got um, no records uh, reported. Um, in Oklahoma, um, which would, is not as surprising for the fact that it's a, a cuckoo bumblebee, um, but also there just haven't been any records. So um, this was the last record um, that we have in Oklahoma for uh, Bombus variabilis. So this is in the um, uh, collection at OSU uh, from 1975. It was recorded um, September 1st, and this is the uh, wants to see the last one that was collected in Oklahoma. There it is. Um, so, uh, so, uh, and so you can see with it being um, September 1st, you know, it's kind of down here um, uh, in terms of um, you know, being a male. Uh, so you can kind of look at the patterns of, uh, I think I plotted months and if, if it was a male or female that was recorded. But that's kind of all the data that we have for, for Oklahoma. So unlikely to encounter those. Um, and then the other one uh, that's being considered for listing is the Southern Plains bumblebee, Bombus fraternus. Um, you can see we've got a lot fewer records reported on iNaturalist. Uh, and you can see um, kind of different activity pattern for them um, in a, a narrow window for, for the males. Um, uh, and so this is the key that um, Emily and Terry um, helped develop. Um, and so these are the ones we went through. We went through American bumblebee, um, the variable cuckoo bumblebee, and uh, the bombus fraternus. Um, they have the eastern carpenter bee on there just for good measure. And then the ones that, I, that are not circled and don't have the check mark are ones that were kind of, were at the periphery of their range, so they're not ones we're really likely to encounter. You know, it's like maybe ones in the panhandle, but you know, it's 
kind of comes over occasionally. Uh, so I circled the other four that I wanted to go through that you might see um, that would be kind of more common ones. Um, so I was gonna run through those um, really quickly as well. Uh, so the black and gold bumble bee bombus um, onotomus, uh, you can see not very many um, sightings uh, for that one uh, because it, when you do see it, it's kind of big, vibrant, noticeable um, bumblebee. Um, uh, bombus uh, by Michaelinus, that one's kind of interesting. The by part of the <coughs> name would kind of refers to the uh, lobes here. Uh, so kind of um, uh, easy to distinguish if you can see. So the two-spotted bumblebee, you can see some more sightings there. Um, and then uh, Bombus uh, griseopolis is relatively common. It's the one that's got uh, kind of a brown uh, band on the cap end. Um, so more sightings of that one. And then we've got Bombus impatiens, the common eastern uh, bumblebee, uh, which is also uh, one of the smaller, uh, on the smaller side of things, um, with quite a few sightings as well. Um, so, and I'll come back to how they contribute with iNaturalist in a minute, but thinking about monarchs and bumblebees, it's pretty easy to kind of match up needs um, for um, habitat. Uh, so, you know, uh, butterflies, you think about native host plants, which for native bees, the corresponding uh, component would be the pollen plants that they're gonna use uh, to provision their, their nests as well as nest and shelter sites. They both need um, nectar plants, um, and then uh, the monarchs also need some shelter as well. So there's a huge amount of overlap um, in terms of you know, benefits to both, so it's pretty easy to incorporate bumblebees into you know, plantings or planting for, for monarchs. Um, so I always like to mention um, Asclepius viridus, our most common milkweed, um, at some of our netting surveys that we've done out of the Stillwater Research Range. It's also the most visited um, flower by bees in May and June. So 28% of our records from May were on Sleepus viridus and 20% from June. Um, so, so a great nectar source as well. Um, and I should have put in a picture of the, the pollinia, but either pollen of milkweeds is in the little pollen sac, so you can kind of see the structure sometimes. And actually sometimes honeybees get kind of stuck because they, they're, they're sticky. So they sometimes have a hard time pulling off of the plants. But a great, great nectar source for um, bumblebees as well as others and lots of, of um, butterflies um, and other bees as well. Uh, and so thinking about incorporating native bees into uh, <coughs> habitat. So you know, we tend to think of monarchs coming through in the spring and then being here in the fall. Um, but of course for native bees, you need to cover the entire uh, growing season uh, for flowering plants. So we need to make sure you've got things that flower at different points in time. And I think one of the challenging things, thinking about gardens, is a lot of times those fall flowering plants, you know, they're gonna be green most of the year, so they may not be as attractive um, as some other ones. Um, delaying fall cleanup. Uh, so if you've got, um, if some of your plants are ones that have really heavy plant stems, so you've got kind of thick stems uh, that could serve as nesting habitat for bees. Uh, you know, if they have nested in those stems, they would, um, you know, overwinter in them. So if you're cleaning up all your, your dead stems um, before the winter, right, then you could be removing those, those nests. Um, uh, so 30% of our native bee species are gonna nest in some type of wood or uh, pithy plant stems. 70% um, of our native bees nest in, in the ground, so they need direct access to bare ground. So you can think about mulching, and, but also needing some access to bare ground. So if you do have some ground nesters, um, you know, I think uh, kind of, uh, you know, slopes so there'd be drainage, um, you know, things like that work well for, for ground nesting bees. Um, and then I think it's important, you know, different plant species may be more or less important at different times and locations. And I think I put in, no, I did not put in there, what I thought. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. So I will say I'm stuck on the Amelia bushes at the OG campus. <laughs> uh, so I don't know that I spend a lot of time looking elsewhere. Probably not, probably would be good to look elsewhere. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I know one year we cut a bunch off of um, sunflowers every year, but OSU cross country. Well, the next year we went over there and the sunflowers were already past blooming, you know, right? So if you think about the blooming period of the plants. And so, and then I know I've had, um, you know, other stuff where like nothing went to it, but then very late in the season, at the very end of the year, lots of stuff is on it. You know, so it's interesting thinking about, um, you know, different plants might be important at different times because there 
their phenology of the plants and when they bloom will also shift uh, depending on the year and the condition. So it's good to have a, a variety of options available. Um, and, and same thing, you can think about providing uh, multiple um, options uh, for host plants, etc. So I looked to see if I could find a good uh, list of bumblebee plants. Um, and I may have kind of failed. It's always interesting when you go look for a recommended plant list for gardens, right? So this is from the Circe Society that I pulled. Um, anyway, so, uh, but it is nice. It's got a description of a lot of these. Um, but there's certainly things that we would trade out for Oklahoma. So, um, you know, we don't have a Scopia natural rule really here. So we would trade that out for Viridis um, and a lot of, a lot of other things. I don't think crown beard is on here, so I'm not sure how Ray can get them to modify this yet. But um, I think Ray Moran's came and popped a few years ago, but uh, that's one of his favorite uh, plants um, for um, and a great resource for, for monarchs. Mm -hmm. Oh, and this video is working. So <laughs> this video, which I was very excited, I got them to all play at the same time. It took a little bit to figure that out. But uh, it's to make a simple point, <laughs> uh, which is that you need, you know, multiple individuals of the host plants if you're providing, right? Because look how fast they eat. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, so. The the monarch is over on the, the left. Uh, this is a black swallowtail, and then these are both fritillaries. But I think the black swallowtail might win the win the race. Um, but uh, it's amazing how how quick uh, they eat. So and it's interesting looking at the pattern too. Um, but yeah, you do need to shoot. Uh, going down there. <laughs> I mean, I can sit here and watch this forever. <laughs> <Neither one should. laughs> and I set it up so they keep looping. So, um, <laughs> if you notice, I'm starting over. But, um, but uh, yeah. okay. so ways to contribute. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of different um, organizations and projects that you can contribute to. Um, I just picked. Um, Kind of the easiest and ones that, that I like. Um, so Journey North, um, so that's where you can report, report your first sighting of a lot of things. So you can, I usually report my first milkweed in the spring. Um, I have a roadside site near my house that I go to every year and check until, and I kind of cheat because you can see the old stems of the milkweed plant so you kind of know exactly where to look. Um, but, uh, uh, and then you can report your first egg and your first monarch and other stages. Uh, and also peak migration. I also struggle with that one because you don't really know it's peak until it's past, right? Mm -hmm. You don't know what was the highest point until after the fact. Um, but, um, you know, I frequently use this. I'm looking to kind of track and see where, where things are at. So it's a great, great resource. Um, and so, uh, and super easy because you're reporting one observation, you know, so you can report. You can report, I think they got it set up, so if you want to report everything you see, you can, but you know, for the most part, um, you know, if you're reporting the first time you see something or you know, when monarchs are coming back through, then uh, that's, that's a great uh, resource. I mean, they've got lots of other things you can report to, too, a lot of other you know, kind of phenology-related um, areas that you can contribute to. Um, Monarch Watch, of course, I'm partial to with the tagging. Um, so, um, and you know, they've been tagging for, for many, many years. Oh, and this is the yellow crown beard that I mentioned that Ray liked, um, but, um, which I think I got seeds from him. And it does, it comes up everywhere, so I does have to be prepared for that. But a great, great nectar plant. Um, so, um, in Monarch Watch, so the tagging is, um, <laughs> is a good, good uh, resource. And then iNaturalist, um, I put this in, I was trying to see, what am I looking for on this one? I am not sure, um, let's, so let's go to the next one. I put in multiple slides. So um, this one is interesting. They say that we have seven species in Oklahoma, but I was gonna point out the Sonoran bumblebee. It's usually considered to be part of the American bumblebee. It's just a different um, color pattern. Uh, so I'm not sure why they have that one um, separated out. Um, so just as a FYI. Um, and then I was going to point out how blurry pictures actually can be very helpful. So this is Emily Sinocris, this is the most Emily, because uh, she's uh, my uh, previous student, oh, I should say Dr. Dr. Guest, um, is now a postdoc at the Oklahoma City Zoo. Uh, but so this is um, the two-spotted bumblebee, but you can see the two kind of spots there mm -hmm. on the abdomen. It's a blurry picture, but it showed exactly what you needed to to identify it. Um, 
up yet, so I'll put some spots. Um, and this is um, from my yard, and so because you can also submit, and actually you could see for Emily that she had submitted a sequence of photos. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so she's got multiple photos down here that she submitted from the same same individual. So I took some examples in my yard. So this is um, Bauman's pencil band, I guess, but like, so here you can see the banding patterns on the abdomen, you know, here you can see kind of the front of the thorax, and then, I'm, so, you know, so between those three pictures, I'd be a little hesitant if I only had, well, I wouldn't know if I had just one of those, right? Um, but collectively combined, I can see everything I need to sit, see to know. So, so even if you don't get good pictures, because it is hard to get good pictures of bumblebees, they um, tend to want to fly away as soon as you're ready. Um, you know, not so good pictures work great too and can provide lots of good, good information. Um, and um, I, so here it shows a lot of the observers uh, that have submitted data. So Emily is here at the top. Um, so she has 181 observations and 60 feet. I think this is David who should be working on his dissertation, which he has not done. So he really should not be submitting these, but I think you should try to <laughs> you should try to compete and make this green jay out of here. Um, so I think you should have a competition. <laughs> oh, because I saw Jay on there. Um, and see who can submit the most and get the most observations for So this is so this would also contribute. We're doing a uh, I don't know if I put in a picture for that. I don't think I did, but we're doing a and actually when Mark Howard Howard comes, you can ask him about bumblebees. But we're doing they have a couple projects they funded to look at bumblebees across the state, so that's one that we're, we're going to be working on, and so getting more observations. And I will say, so when I was putting together all the data for that proposal, you know, there were counties that we had records from, from the iNaturalist sites that we didn't have specimens for in any collection, right? So I mean, lots of good data on distribution from, from iNaturalist, so, you know, it gave us a lot of information we didn't have, um, you know, without pulling those records. And then again, you can easily um, you know, the photos are great um, and a good, good resource. And the other thing you can do is you can um, you can also upload, um, like you could be uploading photos now that you took this summer, right? So they, you know, if you've got uh, previous photos, as long as you know the location and the date um, and everything, you can, can upload um, those at any time, you know, if you've got ones from the past or you don't get around to it for, you know, a couple weeks or something, you can uh, upload them at any point. And I just added this, um, they had a news story on it, so I got lots of questions. And I will say, I didn't really have much to do with this. Um, but, uh, so, um, OSU Facilities Management, uh, their grounds crew, so they, they created this, um, so I think the idea is planes flying over to the Stillwater Airport will mm -hmm. pass over um, this butterfly. Um, and again, I, I I participated some, but I did not try this. I did not, um, I would never have come up with the idea of a butterfly. I was amazed that they came up with that. Um, Pocket Prairie, you know, I, I can get that. And I don't know if you, you probably can't see up there, but they were preparing for planting. So you kind of see the shape. They were getting it ready um, for, and they had students that came out. They had several student organizations that I think had gotten some funding for the garden. Um, so they created all of this. And then, um, and physical sciences, which is the building across from mine, I also didn't have anything to do with this really either, but uh, but they're putting in uh, some more, we have a native plant corridor, which is actually really, really nice. Um, and it has lots of kind of tall plants. Anyway, I, I love it, but I'm, you know, I'm amazed that they've kind of kept it so positive, because you know, some people aren't fond of the taller, larger plants that have, have spread a little bit. But, uh, but they're putting um, this in um, across from my building. So these, are, I think, are little bee hotels. And then they're gonna have a topiary. They've always been big into the topiaries. I don't know if you've seen uh, you know, some of the ones they had the, they had the little OSU figures and um, you know, they'll do the big OSU um, and other things, but they're gonna do a, a butterfly topiary. So anyway, um, so I should take credit for that, but I, I really didn't have, I provided some thoughts on seed mixes and things. Um, but that was, um, um, and plants that would be good to include, but that was the extent of my contribution. Um, and then with that, I would be happy to take any questions. That's a lot of information. Yes. You said you were going to talk about, uh, you know, the best way to tag, the quickest way to tag. I don't know. So now I have to mentally think. So I have a stack in the envelopes. Um, 
And, and so I'm measuring lean. And so, so I have like digital calipers that I use. And so I do that first. Um, and then, um, and then, then I'm like, and then I have a scale for weighing them, but I have to zero my little, we have the little glassine omelets, actually has some in the car. Mm -hmm. I just realized on the way over here. They're kind of like wax paper. You can get them even from you know, Amazon and stuff now. Uh, but then I have to zero the scale to the weight of the envelope, so then I can then put the butterfly in to get a weight for it, right? But then I'll test it for a wee wee and then stick it in to weigh it. So then while the scale is you know, giving a good reading, I can look at my OE sample under the microscope. Anyway, so I kind of have this, you know, like, so I want to save every second I can, and then I've got like 80 of them for all the and 10 o'clock at night. So, <laughs> so you, get to, you get to be, be efficient. Um, but, uh, but I think for um, the Monarch Watch tagging, I think they want to know um, male or female, um, your location, um, but they, that, so it's, it's much more straightforward as ones. But it would be great to get more data on weight um, and lean size. And so what we're hoping to do with the lipid stuff is we could come up with a relationship between like weight measurements and weight that suggests what their lipid scores are, then it would be, because lipids are destructive to so it would be really cool if you could just measure and weigh and get information, you know, tag and release. Um, so we're, I haven't quite gotten that far, um, but we're hoping we'll um, get that developed because uh, that would be a great resource to get more information. And it is fascinating. I, you know, I know Emily and I had talked, you know, because she would say that she was seeing it with you, and I would say, well, you know, so we can text me if you have any today. Um, but it is really fascinating listening to people talk and how we just have very different views of different Showing up in non-urban, non-garden planted settings, right? 
because that would be a concern if it's not going to be spread. Um, uh, so that uh, would be good. But you know, I think, um, but there are monitors that stay along the along the coast. Um, but yeah, at least you know, here with our freezing temperatures. Yeah, and you know, and I guess, um, you know, if you thought it was staying green too long, you could, you know, cut it down. That's the kind of, that's the kind of a concept we saw with him. Did we need to plant thousands of tropical mushrooms as a part of the one of the planning and garden? And we thought, like, well, we're just going to have the, the, the whatever, we're seeing them there, the, the yellow stripes kind of, kind of coming at the same time. And when it's coming up, we're going to cut down the tropical milkweed. Right before they migrate, so they don't want to get confused. <laughs> yeah, and I guess um, you know there'll always be late, you know, late individuals, mm -hmm. those that are migrant or reproductively active, right? So I was trying to think about like, yeah, how when do you, um, you know, because certainly there would be some that would be usually for the fall that would have time to emerge and then migrate. So yeah, figuring out the timing is always a bit challenging. Yeah, that is confusing because we did have a lot. Of Say four years ago, and people were putting it on Facebook. There was probably a thousand butterflies here from the Barry Monarch, and so I came up here and tagged a whole bunch of them. But they were definitely moving, and I and you know Monarch Watch tells you exactly when you're supposed to be tagging and get to your latitude, I think. So it, it is like the end of September into like the first week of October. Mm -hmm. So but it's they, like, they how the heck do you tell if it's a migrating one or not? Yeah, and it is interesting. Um, because we also record like wing winter spores. I did actually, even though I've been doing this for a bunch of years, um, I figured out a better way to do it this year. Because um, you know, some of it's like, you know, how many, you know, are they fresh individuals? So are the mm -hmm. scales on? Because they'll get, you know, the reproductive ones will get really old and you know, just look old, right? Right. Uh, but then there's also then, but then how, so I kind of think separating the scales from the pairs makes sense because you know, sometimes they're damaged, but they have to be really fresh, right? So then, but, um, but I don't know um, what condition um, uh, they were. For, no, they were beautiful. But they were so fresh. Yeah. Yeah. Where can you find a Monarch butterfly sign like the one you had? Uh, mine, Where can was, you purchase one? That was from Monarch Watch. So they have, oh. you can register um, your garden as a Monarch Way station. Oh, and they have a list of things, like so you need to say you've got milk and you know the plant and other things. Um, and um, Emily was just working on a paper on um, Monarch Way Station names. So she had take, taken a class a few years ago on uh, yeah, the meaning of how we name things. And so she um, downloaded you know, 35,000 records of Monarch Way Stations and kind of categorized the names. So think about you know, somehow we can relate what people are naming their way stations to you know, con participating in conservation. So it, it's kind of interesting. I would never have thought to have, have done that, but uh, that she had taken a class where they were talking about the meaning of place names. And, um, so that was interesting. But yep, that was, um, that was yeah, from, from Monarch. Gray Moon has some signs, wildflower signs. Because when you have wildflowers in your front yard, you have to remind people that these aren't weeds. These are precious, wonderful flowers. I will say, uh, one of my daughter's friends who lives across the street from this year, because she just said, it's so sad that you have to put a sign in the yard. <laughs> so, so that was a kid making that observation years ago. Well, you can't get too many uh, Oklahoma native plant signs. I mean, the, the, uh, the roadside signs, they quit making them, so you can't get those anymore, so you got to find you another source. I mean, in my yard, I even have squirrel signs, squirrel crossings and fox crossings, <laughs> like that. You talked a lot about bumblebees, um, and there are a lot of other kinds of bees, too. As far as pollination that goes on in Oklahoma, what percentage of that is done by bumblebees? versus all the other kinds of bees there are. So, but there would be certain plants that require um, the vibration, the sonication, that just have to be bumblebee pollinated, right? Because you're not familiar with the native plants, and there's native plants as well that, you know, use, uh, they have horicidal anthers, so they have to kind of shake it to 
said, we've seen that pollen. So they just require bumblebees, but then everything else, yeah, I guess not. I guess that has to do with flower morphology and what would be a good, good pollinator. Um, and the effectiveness and how many pollen are transferred transfer. Um, are there some plants that are specifically adapted for non bumblebees Showing that uh, you know that native bees were just as effective at pollinating um, as native bees. And certainly, there's some things where you really need you know uh, large monoculture crops where native bees are um, important, where you're not going to get enough native bees. Mm -hmm. but, um, mm -hmm. yeah, but there's been lots of research on uh, native bees and adequate um, in a lot of settings for pollination. Oh well, thank you so much. Thank you. Questions, uh, feel free to ask, and, and if you want to buy some books, come see me. And uh, thank you. I hope to see you guys back next month.
Thank you. 